So, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us at this, the seventh lecture of our special 50th anniversary inaugural lecture series. And it's turning out to be a fantastic anniversary year. Um, I'm, I'm quite often saying, and I know I've heard lots of other people saying how proud they are, um, and how proud this 50th anniversary is making us, so much so that I've started writing proud with a capital O, U, in the middle. <laughs> so... Um, but um, I'm, I'm Liz Marr and I'm the uh, Acting Pro Vice Chancellor for Students here at the OU and I'm very proud, there it is again, and privileged to be hosting one of the university's 50th anniversary celebration events which showcase our research, teaching and knowledge exchange portfolios. Each year the Vice Chancellor invites newly appointed and promoted professors to give an inaugural lecture. And over the course of a year, our inaugural lecture series provides an opportunity to celebrate academic excellence, with each lecture representing a significant milestone in an academic's career. So this evening, we're going to be hearing from Peter Twining, Professor of Education Futures. It says futures in brackets, but I'm going to roll it in. Um, on the topic of, if school is the problem, what is the solution? And, and I think it's very apt for him to be delivering this in our 50th anniversary year, given that our focus, our strategy, our mission is about transforming lives through education in a changing world. And then we're going to have a panel discussion when Peter will be joined by four external speakers, all with a view on schooling. Um, we have James Pilgrim, who's the head teacher at Kent's Hill Park School, Poppy Petru, who is a, an ex student from Summerhill. Um, the co-educational boarding school in Suffolk. Mike Wood, who's um, chair of the Centre for Personalised Education and an expert on home education and flexi-schooling. And Stephen Heppel, who is a leading voice on the role of ICT in learning and professor of new media environments at the Centre for Excellence in Media Practice at Bournemouth University. I don't know if he has to write that after his name every time, but... <laughs> um, so after we hear briefly from each of our panellists, we'll be opening it up for Q&A. And then we'll be inviting you to join us to celebrate with us downstairs. Presumably there'll be cake, I bet. There's usually cake. <laughs> so if there's anybody in the audience who's using Twitter, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag displayed and tagging at Open University. And, um, and let the world join us this evening. And Peter's also a keen user of Twitter. And his Twitter handle is displayed too, is it? Somewhere? Um, it's at Peter T. Um, so for members of our audience who are joining us by live stream, welcome. And please use the email address provided and keep your, keep your comments and your questions brief so that we can try and address them all during the Q&A session. Peter is, as I've said, Professor of Education Futures at the Open University. He has been a primary school teacher, initial teacher educator. He's been the head of Department of Education at the Open University, co-director of the Centre for Research in Education and Educational Technology, and co-editor-in-chief of Computers and Education. And Peter's brought in over £10 million of external funding to the Open University, primarily linked with his focus on the future of education, building upon his understandings of pedagogy, teacher professional learning, educational change, and the role of digital technology in and on schooling. Peter's professional interest is focused on the future of education, and this includes looking at how to change education systems from the inside and rethinking education systems from scratch. A really apt time to be doing that, given the state of flux that we are in, in terms of educational policy in the country at the moment. So it now gives me very great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Twining. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for coming, especially Kieran, who's got a red handkerchief he's going to wave if it's not going well, and an orange one he's going to wave if he thinks it's okay. Thanks, Kieran. Um, no, I'm really pleased you've all joined me, both physically and online. Um, I am going to be asking you to, to join in and vote on some things, and, and if you've got your mobile device, you could set it up now. The URL is pollev.com forward slash Peter T508. That's polev.com forward slash Peter T 508. That will come up on each of the slides where I'm asking you to input your ideas. Um, I thought I'd start by telling you why I'm here. 
Uh, you may have noticed I'm a bit of a late developer. I actually became a professor six years ago, so the inaugural is a bit late. And throughout my education, I was also a bit of a late developer. Uh, I was in the remedial class at my prep school. Um, and I have to say, I've got a lot of bad memories of schooling. Thir at the age of 13, I cried my way through my French common entrance oral exam, ending up with 36%. But worse than that, I've been terrified of speaking foreign languages ever since. When I was 16, I was summoned to see my headmaster who told me I was going to fail all my O-levels because my English was so bad. And then when I got a B for English language, only one of three children in the school that year who got a B or above, they queried the result. <laughs> my daughter at this point said, Oh, didn't. Did the little privileged white boy not like his private school then? And of course, that's exactly the point. Right? If the system doesn't work for a privileged little white boy like me, just think how much worse it is for those people that schooling systematically uh, disadvantages, as I will show you as we go through. through. I, and anyway, as we went on, you know, I had to redo my A-levels. I, I went to university, got really excited about new technology and the use of computers. I wrote an essay about how computers would allow us to transform education. My tutor gave me a third. And as he handed the essay back to me, he looked me in the eye and he said, Twining, people like you shouldn't be allowed to take advantage of higher education. <laughs> so here I am, determined that other people will not suffer in the way that I did through my education system. And of course, I also am here uh, thanks to my parents, family, friends, colleagues, uh, and many others who've supported me through good times and bad. Uh, and of course, I'm building on all the work of many other people, which I hope I've not corrupted too badly um, when, when I've, I've built upon it. And now's the chance for you to try voting. I want you to just give a rough indication of how many years you have spent in formal education. So if you go to that URL, it's pollev.com forward slash Peter T 508 you should see this thing coming up on your screen. I'm just going to make sure it is actually working. There should be a... Oopsie. Yep, okay. And you'll see little green blobs appearing where people have said uh, how long they've had. I can't actually see at the bottom. We've got 22, 23. I'll give you another minute or so to go with this. I mean, what it's showing us is that most of us have actually spent quite a lot of time in formal education. Okay. And... That's important because it's really difficult for us to think out of the box. It's difficult for us to reimagine something that's radically different to the existing system. That was brought home to me um, back in the early you know, so 22 or 23 when I worked with colleagues here, with home educators, with groups of kids in the East End of London who were failing all their GCSEs so we could have as long with them as we liked because it wasn't going to make any difference to anything. And with some very successful boys in a private school down in Plymouth. And we brought in impossibility thinkers and Guy Claxton with his learning power and theatre <coughs> groups and we ran workshops and we tried to really expand our ideas of what ed schooling could be like. And they came up with clean toilets, no bullying, starting a bit later in the day, a bit more flexibility and more ICT. And it's like... <laughs> This is frustrating. And then Kieran, bless him, again, he hasn't got any of his handkerchiefs out yet, which is a bit worrying. Uh, then Kieran said, look, we should give them a lived experience of something radically different. Let's take them into second life. This was in 2006. At the point, there were all sorts of salacious things in the press about what was happening in second life. But we thought that was a really good idea, so we did. So we took hundreds of 13 to 65-year-olds into an island in second life with the intention of giving them radically different experiences of what it could be like to be supported in your learning. And I'll be drawing on some examples from that later on this evening. I'm also going to be drawing on some work on the NP3 project, which was looking at children's use of digital technology outside school, and then how that influenced, or the extent to which it influenced, practice inside school. And I'm going to be particularly drawing upon the 44 children who we looked at in more depth outside school to see how they were using technology, what they were doing with it. So, what am I going to talk about in the next 35 minutes or so? I'm going to try and justify my claim that schooling is problematic. 
I'm going to unpack some elements of a better system, particularly focusing in on how we teach and what we teach. I'm then going to look at, well, so how do we get from here to where we want to be? And then I'll try and pull it all together. I usually encourage heckling, but because I've only got 40 minutes, I'm going to discourage heckling on this occasion. So let's start with, is schooling the problem? And I think in order to answer that question, you have to have some view about what you think the purpose of schooling is. Brian Kaplan has written this comprehensively boring book um, <laughs> demonstrating that schooling is really good at signalling kids who are good at conforming, who are compliant, who are reasonably academically able, and who work reasonably hard. And if that's what schooling should be about, then it's doing a really good job. But I'm not convinced I think that's what schooling should be about. But I thought it'd be fun to see your views. So again, if you go to polyv.com slash ptt508, if you, you get, you'll be able to move these things up and down and rank them in the order you think they should go. If you think that I haven't got the right purpose, and remember it's what it should be, not what it is, but what the purpose of schooling should be, then you can add your own suggestion of what you think the purpose should be. As with all of these things, there isn't a right answer. This comes down to your values, your beliefs about what you think the purpose of schooling should be about, about what we think is important in the world today. Fun. Ah, there's a nice idea. Was that you, Kieran? As you can tell, there's always one, isn't there? This handkerchief isn't out yet. Let's, uh, let's see if I can scroll up and down this thing and see what happens. So you can see what's happening here. Wee, can I scroll up and down? No, it doesn't want me to scroll up now. You can only see the ones at the top. Okay, well, uh, you, you can carry on voting for a minute, but you know, most of us seem to be agreeing that, that it's about preparing people to live in a world today and in the future. I'm going to kind of outline my vision and what my values are about this. And, and, and my vision really for education is that should, it should lead to individual fulfilment and universal well-being. And of course, universal well-being must include rhinos, actually, and honeybees. Because if we don't look after the flora and fauna, ultimately, we are doomed too. <coughs> and I'm going to try and persuade you that school isn't doing that very well. Okay, I, and I'm going to start with a, a, a recent survey from 2018. It is American, which I know is slightly problematic, and it is a relatively small sample of 500 people. Um, these are all American youths who'd left school and were then asked to reflect back about their experience of being in high school. 37% said that they felt afraid of making mistakes most of the time. And anyone who knows anything about learning will understand that if you're scared to make mistakes, you're probably not in a very good learning environment. 51% said they were stressed almost most, all the time or most of the time. 51%. 44% said they were bored all or most of the time. And 52% didn't think school prepared them very well for life after school. And then we go on and we look at issues to do with behaviour. And, you know, just recently, last month, the government announced a £10 million scheme to crack down on behaviour and find new punishments and rewards to control the little so-and-sos. A 34 times increase in the use of drugs to control the behaviour of children with ADHD. An increase in the number of exclusions, and just too many exclusions. And in all of these examples, the children are the problem. There's no question that it might be the school that's the problem. You know, the kids are a problem, so we'll drug them, we'll get rid of them. And of course, you've got an increasing number of people opting out of the state education system and home educating. And then this one. Off-rolling, persuading people that they will leave your school. And I read this, and I looked at that first word. Unsurprisingly, our inspectors expect the system to be inequitable. That's outrageous. 
I want to be part of the system where the inspectors write outrageously some of our children are discriminated against. And of course, the whole system is designed so that around the third of the kids have to fail for the others to be seen to succeed. That's fundamentally flawed. How can you have an education system that is designed to fail a third of its learners? So, I hope I've convinced you that you know, schooling is a problem. And the question is, what can we do about it? So I'm going to start trying to unpack some elements of a better system. I'm going to start with how we teach, with pedagogy. And I have this kind of naive view that how we teach ought to reflect how children learn. Seems to make sense to me. And of course, we're used to the idea of learning by being told. Hey, look, I'm here, standing up and doing it. And we're also used to the idea of learning by doing. But in school, learning by doing is usually decontextualized. You know it's decontextualized in the science experiment when you don't get the result the teacher expects. And rather than saying, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's happening there. Let's investigate and find out why you got that result. She's much more likely to say, copy the results off the group next to you and write it off for homework. And then learning through role play. Now, I ought to know about this because I, I was early years trained, but the Scone Park program really brought it back to me. This is Trixie, Queen of the Pixies. And she came up to me and she said, Ranger, I was the Scone Ranger in second line. Ranger, will you give me away? What do you, what do you mean, Trixie, will I give you away? She said, I want to get married. I want to get married to Wintermute, who was a brain in a jar, as in Futurama. And he also was one of the most challenging characters within Scone Park. And I have to tell you, I wasn't too comfortable about the notion of giving away Trixie to Wintermute. I had this vision in my head at the front of the Daily Mail. You know, just at the moment where they said, you may kiss the bra. I mean, it was all going to go wrong. So I said, Trixie, I really don't think this is a good idea. And we had this kind of debate over the course of about a week. And she came back to me, she said... I said, it, it's got to be PG. Everything on the island has to be PG, parental guidance. So she came back and she said, Peter, they have weddings in PG films. So I s explained to her my real worry about, you know, head of department of education gives away a pixie to a brain in a jar. In the front of the day, it really wasn't going to go down well with our funders. She came back to me and she looked at me and she said, Ranger, you do realise this is all pretend, don't you? <laughs> At which point, they got married. And they had the big white dress, and they had the photographer. The video is on YouTube if you want to go and watch the wedding. And you know, they did the whole bit, and they got to the kissing the bride, which went, you know, kiss the bride, which went fine. And then they had the disco afterwards with virtual champagne. Um, but the important thing is they learned a lot through the process. Now, getting those disco lights to flash in time to the music is really quite complicated to do. Just coordinating it so that everyone knew a wedding was happening and that you know, the Rolls Royce was made in time and that the priest knew her lines and all that stuff and the camera person was there. There was a lot of organisation and stuff to take place. It was a really powerful learning experience. But it was pretend. And then I learned about learning by becoming. That's, that's me, incidentally. Um, and, and it was a kind of takeoff because because on the main grid, I was Skoma Simpson. Sorry, I just, hence the yellow hair. Uh, but anyway, on, on islands in Second Life, you've got a limit to the number of things you can build on an island, the number of prims, the kind of units of building, 15,000. We exceeded that in about three weeks because we said to the people on the island, you can build anywhere you like above 200 metres. So I went back to the community and I said, look, it's your island. How are you going to sort this problem? And it was a problem because when your avatar rendered on the island, you came in with no clothes on, which was quite embarrassing for some of the members of the community. Uh, and you couldn't move and nothing would work. So anyway, they decided they'd investigate different forms of governance, which they did. And they decided democracy was the way to go, which we all know is a mistake, because benign dictatorships, as long as you can maintain the benignness, is clearly much more efficient. But they set up seven government departments, and they had elections, and they elected the officers. 
and they had a planning department and they had planning officers. And the first thing the planning officers did is they came up with building regulations. <laughs> and they went around slapping notices on all the buildings saying, if you haven't got planning permission within a week, we're going to delete your building. Now, I am telling you, there is absolutely nothing pretend. If you spent 40 hours creating something, if someone comes along and deletes it. There were some very powerful discussions <laughs> between members of the community. And those planning officers were not pretending. They were the planning officers. They were deleting people's buildings. And the reactions were real. It was an incredibly powerful emotional experience. And they learned a lot about negotiation and actually about red tape and all sorts of other things as well. Very powerful. And this got reinforced for me on the MP3 project, where I was looking at kids' use of technology at home and how they learnt to become competent users of technology at home, those of them who did, because they didn't all. This is Rory. He was 11. He was a gamer. He made mods, so he extended games, and he then shared those extensions with other people. He also filmed himself doing things within Minecraft. Uh, he actually also made all sorts of movies and put them on YouTube and stuff. And the way he'd learnt was his mum, when he was seven, bought a book on Minecraft and worked through the book with him until he got better than she was, at which point she fell to the wayside. And he carried on, and he was then allowed to interact with his friends, people he knew in the physical world he could interact with online. And then gradually he was allowed to interact with other people in Minecraft who he didn't know in the physical world. And he became really sophisticated in knowing where to go for help. And he was inducted into the Minecraft community and became a valued member of that community who other people then started coming to when they needed help and support. And then we had Latifa. Latifa was a Somalian refugee, aged 10, living in a small flat in North London, shared a bed with her mum. She made YouTube videos. She made skits of being a parent or being a teacher. They were hilarious. And she had a really sophisticated understanding of different genres of YouTube videos. She had a sophisticated understanding of how to present things in an amusing way. And perhaps more importantly, she understood how to interact with people through the comments underneath the videos. And she had some lovely ideas about how to deal with haters and actually turn it into a positive. You're getting me more hits. Keep going. Because people are coming in to read your hate comments, and it's great because I'm becoming more famous. Her brother had made a lot of money through, through this stuff. But again, the way that she had learned to do it was being supported and inducted into it by her siblings and her mum. She was amazing because actually, I mean, she called herself a techno nerd, but she, she you know, Googled how do I reinstall Windows because the editing software she used wouldn't run on the latest version of Windows, so she had to roll back to a previous version of Windows. I don't know how many of you can do that, but I think that's pretty clever. Um, and she'd taught herself how to do it. But because she'd been supported by, by her family in, in having the confidence to engage with these things. So... What am I thinking learning is, and, and, and this happens to align with a socio-cultural perspective. I didn't realise that at the time, but that's where I got to. And, and from a socio-cultural perspective, learning is about identity formation. It's about who you are and your place within your communities. It's about becoming a member, participation, in an enduring collection of people, a community, who are mutually engaged in shared endeavour, who have shared purpose, and shared ways of working, shared valued ways of working. And from a socio-cultural perspective, learning is intrinsically motivating. We do it all the time. We can't avoid it. And importantly, knowledge is the ability to act in valued ways in particular contexts. And so learning is something that is personally meaningful and ongoing and always situated. So if I was going to kind of formalise this, you know, from, from a sociocultural perspective, human learning, you know, we do it because we're interested. We've got a personal goal we want to achieve, which might be entertaining ourselves. Um, it's intrinsically motivating. It happens whenever we can do it, inflexibly. It's not timetable or schedules. It tends to be something that happens over a prolonged period of time. You know, you don't become expert at being a gamer in Minecraft or making YouTube videos by doing it for 50 minutes. It happens in context. The teacher are the other members of the community, the other club members. And their role is to induct you 
into the valued ways of being. They're orchestrating your activities and connecting you to the mature practices within that community. And the learner is seen as having expertise, but not experience in that particular community. So they've got expertise in other things that they bring to the piece. Okay? So it's about how you bridge between the expertise and experience they've got and the valued ways of working within the new community. And mostly it's about learning through becoming and role play. And in a sense, role play is pretending to be. So it's a first step before you actually become. And that kind of contrasts radically with how we expect people to learn in schooling. And I won't read through that because you can read that yourself. But in a sense, this is another critique of the education system. That actually, the way we expect people to learn with informal education does not sit well with how people actually learn. And so we're running against the tide all the time. So what does this mean for how we teach? Bearing in mind that I think how we teach should reflect how we actually learn. Well, first of all, I think it's important to say, you know, it's about multiple approaches. There isn't one right way to do things. You need to look at the needs of the learners and align your approach with the needs of the learner. But trust is really vital. You've got to be able to have the confidence to make mistakes and share and be open and acknowledge your weaknesses. Constructive critical feedback, but notice bi-directional. This isn't just the teacher telling the learner. It's also the learner telling the teacher what they could be doing better. How could you support me more effectively? How helpful was that as feedback to me about what I'm doing? It does involve direct instruction. That doesn't mean didactic standing at the front telling people. Direct instruction is about the learner and the teacher having a shared understanding of what they're trying to do, what the purpose is, and what success will look like, and how they're going to get there. And importantly for me, that doesn't have to come from the teacher to the child. It could be the child telling the teacher what the purposes and goals and success will look like. And of course, that means it's about being agentive and active. It's about collaborating with other people. It's about that participation piece. And it's about bridging between, and I've already said this, bridging between the learner's current expertise and experience and the valued ways of being within the particular community that they are becoming a part of and inducting them into that new community. But of course, it's also about challenging. It's about pushing people to stretch themselves, but in ways which are achievable so that you build their self-esteem and their belief in themselves as a learner. And importantly, it's sustained. And that brings us on to the question of curriculum and what do we teach? Because if we're thinking about sustained, we're talking about depth, not breadth. So what should be learnt? What does everybody need to learn, given that when we think about schooling, we assume it's something that all our kids are going to go through? Guess what? Your turn. Polyv com forward slash peter t508 you can't add ones to this you can just change the order in which they appear so you move them up and down on your screen and when you finish you click the submit button and then it will be reflected on the screen here my daughter bless her yeah the one who said our didums said to me dad reading should be on this list it's really important and i thought oh, provocative response 2033, remember it does say 2033. What's important in 2033, okay? My provocative was, actually, Jess, I don't think reading's going to be that important in 2033. Now, the guy who services my alarm drives in his van, and when an email comes in, the van reads it to him, and he dictates a response. It puts things in his calendar for him. He's still driving this van, right? No reading involved, or writing for that matter. So that was the kind of provocative response, and Jess was really, she's a primary school teacher, she thought reading was really the thing. And then I said to her, actually, the real reason, Jess, is I used to have 36 things on this list, but it took people too long to sort them. And so I just cut it down to a kind of sample of things. It's still quite difficult to make decisions about these things. Let's see what we've got. Oh, look, science facts, pretty down, low down the list. Yeah, learning to learn, creeping up the list. Being able to ask good questions and evaluate information. So what we're seeing coming up of the list here are, are, are the kind of things that, that 
we might label incorrectly as 21st century skills because they were around in 1967 when the Plowden report was written. But of course, this is a really difficult question to answer because none of us know what it's going to be like in 2033. Now, if we just go back 14 years to 2005, now Kodak was still the dominant force in photography. YouTube, the first video was uploaded in April 2005. Facebook.com, the domain name, was bought in August 2005. Netflix was still sending videos through the post. <laughs> the smartphone didn't come around until 2007. It was just, it wasn't even a fantasy in someone's mind at that point. Well, it probably was, because we'd all been trying to play with Palm Pilots and things for ages. But true smartphones didn't come out until 2007. Twitter, 2007, all these other things, 2009 or later. The world has changed phenomenally fast in the last 14 years. And the speed of change appears to be accelerating. So 2033, who knows? But we do know that we face a load of challenges. We face challenges around surveillance capitalism, you know, privacy, data ownership. How would you feel if you got arrested walking down the street in Manchester because you covered your face from the face recognition camera? Happened to somebody last month. They were fined 60 quid. Okay, is that an invasion of privacy, or do you feel comfortable with that? Biotechnology and genetic engineering, you know, who decides what characteristics of a human being we should engineer out or engineer in? Will it just be the rich people who can afford the technology? Or should we all have some say in what's appropriate and what's not appropriate? Robotics, AI, and cyborg engineering. What does it mean to be a human being when computers can do the things that we used to call intelligent? What does it mean to be a human being when you can augment our physical capabilities with robotic components? <coughs> so I can hear what Kieran is saying to Rebecca because I've got the little gadget in my ear that enhances my hearing. It just changes the nature of what human beings are and how we view ourselves. And of course, you've got all the stuff about automation and employment. You know, the, this kind of stuff, you know, by 2023, 47% of the US po po employed population will be unemployable. And then you get the kind of neoliberal argument, yeah, but new jobs will come along. It'll all be fine. And then you get other people saying, yeah, but the new jobs will be automated too. And you'll end up with all the rich people owning the factories and no one with any money to buy anything. So the rich people won't be rich because they'll be making stuff no one else can buy and the breakdown of market capitalism. What is the purpose of school if most of the population are unemployable? And then we've got all the things to do with demographic and environmental challenges, you know, population growth, increasing age demographics all the stuff to do with resource sustainability, pollution, and global warming. And, you know, attitudes towards mass migration, Trump and his wall. And all of these things lead to greater risk of, of civil strife and conflict. And I personally think schools ought to be equipping kids not just to address these issues, but to really have a say about how we want the world to be. So my curriculum would look something like this. On the individual fulfillment side, you know, I think it's about identity. It's about finding your passion, your purposes in life. It's about building your self-esteem, your belief in yourself as a learner. It's about getting success and recognition for the things you have done and achieved. And it's about being able to deal with the... I was going to say shit, and I probably shouldn't in an OU inaugural. With all the stuff that is going to get thrown at you through life, um, so you've got to have the resilience and the persistence to deal with that stuff. And then on the kind of universal well-being side, it's about the participation. It's about our values and understanding and talking about our values. It's about diversity and welcoming and recognizing the importance of diversity.
It's about intercultural understanding. And even if we don't agree, at least being able to empathise, to put ourselves in the other person's position and understand their perspective. It's about equity. And rights, remember the rhinos. And obviously sustainability, because otherwise we are all doomed. And then for me, there's the kind of glue in the middle that holds all these things together, which is around the ability to act about agency. And it's the kind of, you know, those 21st century skilly things. But I've added in things like philosophy and ethics, because, you know, we have some really hard decisions to make around those global challenges. And fundamentally, you know, the only thing we know about 2033 is it's going to be different. And it's going to be continually changing. And so learning to learn, for me, is probably the single most important thing. And of course, you've got to have content, because you can't do any of that stuff without content. Right? So that kind of you know, argument, is it content, is it skills, is a complete nonsense, because you can't do skills without content. It's meaningless. And I agree with the Boston Centre for Curriculum Redesign, who say, you know, the content should be the kind of big conceptual ideas that allow us to make sense of the world. Now, the notion of a system, you know, we can have the nervous system, we can have an ecosystem, we can have a law system, and all sorts of places where you can have systems. So you can apply that concept of system in lots of different contexts. And there are lots of other big ideas that are really important to help us make sense of the world. And they are the things we should be focusing in on. So to pull it all together so far, you know, my vision is about individual fulfillment and universal well-being. I think my pedagogical approach, the way we teach, is about enhancing human learning. And you know, we need a curriculum that enhances, that focuses on the content, the skills, and the attributes, bearing in mind that knowledge is about the ability to act in meaningful ways in particular contexts. But you know, that's pretty tame. I think we need to be a bit more radical. I agree with Kerry Facer, who said, you know, we really need to analyse what is the purpose of school? What could and should school be doing in a world in which actually voice is becoming more problematic and politician? I mean, let's not talk about politicians. And so for me, there's an issue around, you know, open to people. No, okay, so we're doing away with age and we're saying we'll have people, but we're still talking four to 18 year olds. Why are we still talking four to 18 year olds? Why are we still front-loading all that stuff? Why, why aren't we making it lifelong, and why aren't we really valuing the older members of our community? Uh, Sugatra Mitra and his granny cloud is onto something. I know we may be doing away with timetables and 50-minute lessons, but we're still thinking 8.30 to 3.30. Why are we thinking 8.30 to 3.30? Why aren't we saying it's when it fits in with your life? It's when you need it. It's flexible. Open to community. I always love the notion of being open to community and then building the eight-foot security fences. Um, always seems to me that there's some conflict here. Um, but, you know, we do invite people to come in to visit the school sometimes, and we do occasionally bring kids out of the school into the community. But I think we need to kind of completely rechange the focus here. You know, the school should be at the heart of the community, not a little isolated island in the middle of it. And we need to move away from that focus on individuals learning to individuals learning through enhancing their communities, because it's about individual fulfillment and universal well-being. So, you know, here's my new summary. We've got to be open to people, lifelong learning, not just 5 to 18. I should say 4 to 18. My daughter told me off for that as well. It should be open when needed, 24-7. It should be about enhancing human learning through impacting on their communities. And we need that mix of content, skills, the application of information, and attributes. What we need is SCOME. Not school, not home. SCOME, the education system for the information age. Automation age, I updated it. It was the information age in the good old days when we were doing it. But heck, how do we get there? from here, because we all know how difficult it is to change education systems. Christensen and colleagues have this model for disruptive change. And what they say is, if you've got an existing system that's got existing clients 
who are doing okay against some existing performance measures, and you bring in a disruptive innovation like a new model of schooling, there's a lot of catching up to do before you're as good as the existing system. And in that situation, the incumbents nearly always win. And what you need to do if you want to bring about significant change is you need to, first of all, compete against non-consumption. In the context of school, that means deal with the kids who are not being dealt with by the current system, those who are excluded or who are failing in the existing system. So deal with them and come up with metrics that work for them. And in that situation, the new entrants nearly always win. And in Australia, they're doing exactly this. So big picture schools, which are kind of scomy in several ways. They're about passion projects. They're about kids actually working, having real jobs in the community at least one or two days a week. They're about parental involvement. Um, there's no assessment as such except presentations to the local community. And what they're doing, which is really interesting, they've got mainstream schools with their standard programs, their standard provision, and then they're tacking on big picture academies. And they're saying, you can apply to move from the standard program into the big picture academy stream. And in some schools, it's aimed at the gifted and talented kids, who they want to stretch more through the big picture process. In some schools, it's the kids who are being excluded and who are failing in the existing system. In some schools, it's just any kid who thinks, oh, that looks more fun. And guess what? They're helping to refine the big picture model. They're providing evidence of how efficient and how effective it is, and more and more people are opting out, opting across. But you know, the problem is assessment. Those new metrics, that's the killer. Because summative assessment drives curriculum and it drives pedagogy. Teachers, quite rightly, do what they're held accountable against. They should do that. The problem is we hold them accountable against the wrong things. And actually, often, that high-stakes assessment isn't really about the kids at all. It's about the quality of the school. It's about the league tables. And of course, terminal exams, aptly named in my view, <laughs> are great if you're interested in content, but are absolutely useless for most of those other things. We've got to be able to do better. And I don't have the answers, but I have some kind of thoughts about directions of travel. So AI, data mining. Now, this is, is one of the first challenges you meet in the education version of Minecraft. You have to get out of that valley, right? And you're leaving a digital footprint of everything you do. So you can look at how long do they try to get out? How persistent are they in solving the problem? How different is their solution to other people's solution? How creative have they been? To what extent do they talk to other people and get advice from other people? You can, get, you can infer a lot from the digital footprint that gets left behind. But there are massive problems, ethically, about data ownership and about transparency. Transparency both in the sense of, do you know you are being assessed? But more importantly, can the system explain why they've come up with the judgment that they have? Because very often, AI systems can't or have bias built into them, which is concealed. So there's some big issues with that. And then there's point of learning, which I helped to develop with two of my colleagues. Um, and, and Paul offers a completely new model, a completely new approach, uh, which goes something like this. You can make, you agree some targets, some things that we're wanting to, to measure, if you will, and you agree what you'd see happening if someone was meeting those targets. Okay? And then you can make claims. So we could have a target about doing a really fantastic presentation. You are brilliant at doing public speaking. Right? And so I could make claims saying, yep, I've done that. Kieran, where is the handkerchief? Thank you. Yep, I've done that. And Kieran could make a claim for me saying, yeah, I saw Peter doing that. And I could have an external assessor, an independent person saying, yep, I saw Peter doing that. And what you build up over time is multiple people making claims saying, I saw that person demonstrating that they had achieved that target. That's really quite credible. You build up over three months, half a dozen people who said, yeah, I've seen him do that on multiple occasions. He can do that. That's pretty convincing. Compared with exams, where you do some stuff and then you sit down for three hours, and if you're on a bad day, God help you. Or if you're bad at exams, God help you. Um, 
I, I think Poll is more convincing in lots of ways. But of course, as with lots of systems, in a high stakes context, there's a real danger of gaming the system. So we need to address some of those things. And of course, the real obvious alternative is open access. Why worry about the qualifications? You know, the OU's done it for 50 years. Open entry to our undergraduate programs. It works. But of course, that involves a massive paradigm shift, a mind flip from gaming the system, getting the credits, to thinking about actual learning. It involves you thinking about trust and meaningful engagement, where success is not measured by what I got given in the grade and the exam, but is about actually what I'm now able to do and competent doing. So to pull it all together, I hope I'm still on time. No one has waved at me yet to say you've got to shut up soon, Peter. Some key, key, key points, takeaways, as my son would say. You know, we are learning beings. Teaching should enhance how we learn. What we teach should empower people, empower people to act and influence the future. It is about knowledge, the ability to act in valued ways in particular contexts, <coughs> skills and attributes. We've got to change the culture of high stakes assessment where the focus is, is more on gaming the system and manipulating the system and actually about measuring the school and how the school is doing than it is actually about learning. And we've got to change that. It is a paradigm shift and we need it. We've got to move from distrust and coercion, from fining parents if their kids don't come to school, from penalising kids who misbehave, from forcing people to learn things that they don't understand the relevance of, to a system of trust where we believe people actually want to learn and where we support them to do that. And we need a strategy for doing it. And, you know, the strategy that I've suggested, you know, start with the low-hanging fruit. Start with those people who the system isn't currently supporting very well. Devise metrics, and this is the really hard bit, that show what they have learnt, but in meaningful ways. So we're measuring the things that matter not just the things that it's easy to measure in a paper-based exam. Refine the model, because it's not going to be perfect to begin with. And demonstrate that it works, demonstrate its efficacy. And of course, you know, so I think what I hope I've convinced you that schooling currently is a problem, that actually solutions do exist, and there are other ones out there like big picture schools. The challenge for us really is, does the, I'm looking at the mayor, does the political will? <laughs> Thank you. We are going to have a panel discussion afterwards, but if you want to follow up, I blog at Half Baked Education. Uh, my kids thought that was the inappropriate picture, that it should be something else. Um, some of the lucky people here will have got the MP3 pen, which has got the URL for the MP3 project, if you want to follow that up. And the SCOME website is still there. I've been trying to kill it off since 2007, but without very much success. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, I have got so many questions. I'm going to go and write them all down and see if Did I can... Did she say scone and write them all down? Yeah, scone and write them all down, yes. <laughs> Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Um, and now we're going to hear briefly from our panel on what they think about that topic, if school is the problem, what is the solution? And, and I've got, um, I'm, I'm going to introduce just all four now, but they're going to come up on the platform one at a time, um, say that a little bit, and then they're going to go over and sit with Peter. And then when we get to the last person, I'm then going to come back up and I'm going to um, ask you for your questions and, and comments for the panel. So the, th the four people that you will be seeing are first of all James Pilgrim, head teacher of Kent's Hill Park School, Poppy Petru, an ex-student from Summerhill, um, which you may have heard of, co-educational boarding school in Suffolk, 
Mike Wood, Chair of the Centre for Personalised Education and an expert on home education and flexi-schooling, and Stephen Heppel, a leading voice on the role of ICT in learning and Professor of New Media Environments at the Centre for Excellence in Media Practice at Bournemouth University. So we're going to start with James, then it's Poppy, then it's Mike, and then it's Stephen. So can you remember that? Good. Okay. Learning at SCOME or something. Okay. So I'll hand over to um, James. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Um, Peter, congratulations on your inaugural lecture. Um, it was excellent. I'm not sure how these things work, but I hope it's the first of many. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the red flag, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> um, thank you for the invite um, for, for this, uh, this evening. Um, I think there's a really good debate around education wholesale at the moment. Um, I'm quite active on Twitter, um, as I know Peter is, and uh, uh, there's, there's lots of things flying around there and various uh, people getting upset about various things as well. It seems to be the main thing. Um, I welcome this discussion around schools, the purpose of schools, the purpose of education. Um, but I, as I said in one of my recent tweets, I think I'm the token traditionalist here. Okay, so please be gentle with me in terms of some of my thoughts. Um, just to give you a bit of context, um, Kensal Park School opened as a brand new all through school in September uh, this academic year. Um, we opened with 120 uh, pupils in year seven and 30 in year three. Um, so we're really, really new into this. Um, we are part of a new wave of schools from the New Schools Network and we are literally just around the corner. Um, as you can imagine, the opportunity to uh, create and develop my own school, our own school, almost from the ground up, um, is incredibly exciting. It's a real rare opportunity. And speaking to colleagues at other schools that I know, um, they were very jealous of that opportunity. So it gives us the opportunity um, to address many of those issues in education, or some of those issues perhaps in education, that we find so frustrating, certainly from the state school system and, uh, uh, and, and how that impacts on the children. Um, however, I find myself... Um, too many times probably growling at the radio as I, I make way, way, my way into work. Um, I hear commentators saying, you know, schools should do more. It's the school's responsibility to do this for every ill that seems to befall society. Um, and I can promise you, we are trying to do everything that we possibly can. Um, we're very much at the front line, I find, of pastoral, social, emotional support and understanding for children um, and their parents sometimes. Um, and it feels increasingly like there's in, uh, a high demand for this and that it's increasingly complex, complex issues um, that we're dealing with as external support is gradually withdrawn and cut. As I said, we're trying to do everything that we can. Um, we do this, and this isn't a whinge, but I'm going to take the opportunity to say it, um, with less funding than ever, with ever-increasing accountability measures, and constraints, a recruitment and retention crisis that sees nearly half of all teachers in England leave within five years. That can't be right and needs addressing. So this discussion around education and whether it's fit for purpose, I fundamentally welcome. We set up Kensal Park, I think it's probably fair to say, um, in a fairly traditional way. Um, we've had no input into building design whatsoever. That was all the local authority. But we do have a teacher in front of every class, five times a day, all the day in, in the primary school as well. Our systems and routines are not dissimilar to probably many of the other schools that you'd see as you walked around Milton Keynes and around the country. And we're certainly consistent with the, with the trust with which we belong. So why do we set it up like this? There are a number of reasons. Firstly, as a school, as a head teacher, I believe that children should know the best that has been thought and said. We're developing a knowledge-rich curriculum that identifies and clearly sets out what we expect children to know at different points of their schooling. We make judgments as professionals about what we think the core knowledge is and where the hinterland of knowledge is. This is based on ideas uh, from Christine Council, the hinterland being the context that links everything together so that pupils are allowed to develop the schema to move that short-term learning into their long-term memories. We've done lots around cognitive load theory, and I'm really keen that my staff research as much as possible. It develops us as individuals and as professionals, and it develops our teaching style all the time. 
Secondly, we do this because we believe that in order to apply and develop skills in a variety of new or different situations, pupils need the confidence and knowledge to support them. You couldn't possibly hope to write about the fall of the Berlin Wall, or you couldn't possibly hope to talk about the water cycle, whatever it may be, without that knowledge that sits behind it. So our starting point is always about the knowledge and the content that sits behind the work that we're doing. And then comes the application of that knowledge into the skills or the activities or whatever it is the teacher is asking them to do. From my experience, so-called discovery learning doesn't really work. If I give a class of 30 year nine children on a Friday afternoon the opportunity to go and discover a topic, it's carnage, okay? Um, and it just doesn't work for us in, in, the, in the situation that we have. So we've made it very clear that knowledge comes first for us and then we look at how we apply it to different situations and scenarios. Therefore, the teachers in our classrooms are the experts. They're the professionals in their subject areas. They're the ones that have studied long and hard and continue to study their particular areas of interest and the materials that go with them. It's the pupil's responsibility, I feel, to deliberately listen and deliberately concentrate on what they say and teach. It is through this that we help to develop those skills, we help to develop the context, we help to develop the schema that allows this knowledge to move into their long-term memories and, more importantly, teaches them the skills of being able to retrieve it when they need it. That's why we also focus fundamentally on behaviour. It's really essential for children to listen and concentrate and not be distracted. Behaviour has to be excellent so there are no distractions to learning and children can concentrate. We don't use technology as a pupil learning resource at Kensal Park in any of our classrooms. We believe that whilst it's a powerful resource and staff and systems rely heavily on it across the school, they are a distraction from the learning and from the teacher. There's too much interference, too much noise and pressure on children to use phones and smartphones, and they can't resist the temptation. It's as simple as that. 90 seconds, I think, is the average time it takes before someone responds to a text message. Give that to a 12-year-old, I would argue it's markedly less. Therefore, we, as adults in the classroom, have to model and demonstrate how we learn, how we behave, the progress we want to make and develop the ideas and that includes from my point of view with technology. Ultimately at present in schools we are preparing children to take and pass exams. Is this per the purpose of the schools? Philosophically I really hope not um, but my belief is that we must attempt to provide children with the knowledge and skills that they can apply to different situations and one of those is an exam. The idea that we're preparing children for jobs and industries that don't yet exist, this shift happens idea that's been around for a long, long time, is a bit tiresome, if I'm honest. Um, they were saying that years ago when I was at school as well. Um, I've only anecdotal evidence for this, but the vast majority that I know <coughs> people from school are working in jobs and industries that we knew very well existed. So we need to move on from that. But we do have to assess children. We do have to find out how much they've learnt at school. We are, after all, spending billions of pounds of taxpayers, our hard-earned money. Although blunt and ineffective and fallible, the exam system is one way of doing this. However, I rail against the idea that schools are simply preparing pupils to pass exams. It's not a philosophy on which I've set up our school. I believe, we believe as a school, that you learn as much outside the classroom as you do within it. But that if you prepare children well, exam success will be a natural outcome of good learning in all of its forms. One of the differences of Kent Hill Park School and many others is, as I mentioned at the start, that we're an all through school. This means that when we're full, we'll take children from ages two to 16 and ultimately 18. In 2009, there are only about 13 all through schools in England. And according to the new schools network of which we're a part, around 25% of all new schools will be all through in the future. This equates roughly to about 150 since 2011. Not many, but growing steadily. What this means is that we can do things differently. We're not constrained by traditional systems, routines or transition points. We've already timetabled our teaching staff across both primary and secondary phases. That's definitely out their comfort zone, I can assure you, for secondary staff when they're that small and want to hold your hand. 
Um, but uh, we have aligned our curriculum, we've aligned our assessment models, and we've aligned the timings of our school day. But more importantly than that, the intangible benefits of our pupils working with significantly younger or older children in different phases and the responsibility and rewards that that brings and the removal of traditional transitional points are really vital to developing some of those softer skills, manners and attributes that we wish to see in our young people. And I'd rather mischievously finish by saying we don't need any new technologies for that. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> so my name's Poppy Patru. Um, I attended Summerhill School, which is in Suffolk. Um, show of hands, who knows Summerhill? Amazing, great, okay. Don't have to give the whole spiel. So, starting from the top. So I never enjoyed having elders having authority over me. Uh, I had no respect for anybody around me because I never felt respected, never listened to, considered, or even part of a decision. And as one standing on two legs, I feel and I felt that I have a say no matter what, what age, in fact. I'd always been used to the norm that children had to be under an elder's voice. I'd been trained to do and think, sorry. <laughs> I'd been trained to think ad how adults, sorry. <laughs> I'd been trained from adults as they knew best. A parent is expected to put their child through the system, which sparks a problem to me. I understand the norm is reality, but people only seem to think that the system is the way forward, as if there's no alternative, but there is, and it is hidden away. My young self was energetic, charismatic, and creative, although I'd always felt something missing as a child. One thing that sparked in my mind was not spending as much time with my father as, as I should have. This being quite minor, leading to issues within relationships and friendships. Now, my point is, others have intense home issues, which I was unable to relate to, but I can only imagine what staying in the system would have done for me, never mind them. From experience, I wasn't satis satisfied with the support I was given. Forcing children into a system in which they're not happy with themselves, others around them, creating unnecessary nasty dramas as there's nothing better to do with their time. I never had the freedom to express my learning. At age 10, I had been monitored for the diagnosis of ADHD, as if I were a scientific experiment. I was actually placed in a room to be watched, written about, judged. I was diagnosed and put on Ritalin, which was prescribed a drug, as you probably know. Ritalin creates a space in which I felt I were a zombie, tired, drowsy, numb, feeling pretty much under the weather. I was skin and bone, I'd been drugged up with Ritalin and the effect it had on me was so powerful. I'd been shifted from school to school, putting thoughts in my head as if something had to be wrong with me. Everybody around me were getting on with their work, just not me. Something I noticed about my early schooling experience was the attitude towards pupils from staff members, as if everything were the pupils' faults. Schools seem to see problems as being the pupils, never ever taking responsibility, whether that is learning, bullying, or any support needed. I'd moved to secondary school thinking as, as a new start, as an opportunity to meet new people and have a nice time. I attended for half a year, considering this is a couple of months, very unproductive, it was dreadful. I'd been bullied, picked on from the way that I used to look, it dragged me down, teachers were not taking any care of me. I'd have physical fights, my mum had to come and pick me up in the car because a girl would be ripping my hair out outside of school and nobody did anything about it. I was sinking into a hole and I really couldn't get out of it, out of aggressive, nasty, humiliating people surrounding me, not serving me well at all. Aside from personally, education was not seen as a short process. It was seen as a forceful, long period of time in which we are trained to be the same as each other, with good exam results, of course. Is this really what we want to be making our students go through, the state school system where exams are forced, having to obey teachers who are just there to do their job, not having a care in the world, at least from my experience? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'd have the common sense to realise and sense the teacher saw me as that interruptive, disrespectful irritation I was, because I definitely was. This didn't help when they were trying to give me tasks to complete. So moving on to my experience of Summerhill, 
I'll talk a little bit about it for those that don't know. I'd been told about Summerhill by my mother, asking if I wanted to visit. And the summary of it is, is Summerhill is a democratic boarding school in which students and teachers are equal. There are 70 pupils attending between ages four and eight, and you cannot start above 11 years old. Lessons are optional, giving children the freedom to explore their hobbies, passions, and themselves. There are wake-ups and bedtimes, which community members run for the Betty's Officer Committee. 14 heads get on, being two a day, waking children up and putting them to sleep. If you are not awake by 8.30, you are fined. You can be 10% of your pocket money takes, is taken away. You can get 20 minutes of a job fine, cleaning leaves outside. I'd had a day visit, walking along the path, seeing students roam freely, running around, play fighting, climbing trees, climbing on staff members even. And I remember it was the place that I belonged. I'd been told I wasn't allowed to attend unless I was taken off of Ritterling. So I was able to express myself, even if this meant the community had to deal with me. And it was hard, hard work, trust me. Um, Summerhill isn't the real world. It's a boarding school, a closed community, which was a struggle after leaving. Having that so social structure for such a long time after five years, being home with my parents and no social networks was very difficult. Graduating, being in that headspace, being mature and competent, as people tend to say I am, I struggled with my age group, pretty much, um, which meant I'm now mingling with people that are nearly a decade older than me. I mean, they've been through lots of different things and I just haven't, and that's something that I've really struggled with. Summerhill, um, as stated, helped me explore my pa passions. I had access to a studio recording space in which I was able to instrumentally experiment, find my genre, expand my set skills, musically confident and being self-taught because I had the choice. As a 17-year-old leaving a community of five years, it was somewhat haunting, although the skills I'd learned over the experience gave me great worth ethic, worth ethic, ethic <laughs> to work for what I wanted to do. Summerhill gave me a gift in which I learned to make decisions for myself, developing in a comp competent, engaged, adult-capable of ma manner, making my way in the world with the confidence to tackle the challenges the world throws at me. So what should schooling be? And I have no conclusion. <laughs> there is so much I could say, but let's go for it. <laughs> I don't agree with the current system in which everybody has to spend six hours seated, shown how and what to learn. Evolving as a person is a compulsory part of growing. And I cannot bear the thought of the comparison with schools and prisons being so similar. Uniform, you have to attend. You can't go to the toilet unless you ask. Showers even, some have them. Why is the norm to prepare for the world by mentally and emotionally destroying young people, having to sit exams we will never use? Schools are broken, not only struggling to be kept open, but they are, they're broke financially. What I can't get around my head around is having a world in which new humans are created to be trained as if they're clones. I want an educational system that merges the creative, fun, educational part of a, human, of a young person's life, being able to create a system in which every head has a voice and an opinion, a space in which young people can freely roam the grounds exploring nature, a free, fun, refreshing space in which memories are treasured, importance of belonging and, part, and being part of something. I believe student choice is so key. Why have teachers run a school their way when in fact it's about the student's experience? I am deeply saddened how children are expected to spend their childhoods. Passion and self-expression is so important and I feel the system is very restrictive. Having the freedom to learn what I want, run my own events, organize my own life in itself, teach, te taught me, in fact, the basics of organization, responsibility, and these opportunities helped me very much in later life. In state schools, how can you demonstrate you are good at X if schooling doesn't let you experience the outside world? And the work life. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Good evening. Crude measures of absenteeism and behavior are being used in schools as indicators of failing schools leading to proclaim reason is no excuse as a behaviour policy to protect their school's ranking. If you have autism or Tourette's, your behaviour can remain a disciplinary issue, especially if your family is a victim of the CAMS waiting list. CAMS is the Children's Mental Health Services. 
Parents are forced to drag children kicking and screaming into school, since if they're not in school, they're not learning. What a child learns from this experience remains debatable, of course. The parents of some children with, P with a PTSD diagnosis, yes, they get PTSD diagnoses from the school experience, are still, finding, are still being fined because case law says that anxiety is no defence for non-attendance, forcing growing numbers of parents to offer all their children. When CAM's rating lists run into two years and even three years in some areas, there's a dramatic effect on the whole family. If parents can arrange a diagnosis, it allows the school to treat issues as behavioural rather than therapeutically. It's like Canute, commanding nature to turn the tide. At one time, families opted to home educate to provide a personalised education, and later it was they were concerned about bullying. Recently, parents off role to avoid bullying by institution. A suitable education must relate to what is of intrinsic value to the student, rather than an arbitrary notion of intellectual value. Education must be curiosity-driven, flexible and personal. If children are to fail to engage, it's not a disciplinary issue. It's an engagement issue. Do things differently. Blame the child is like blaming the patient for not getting well. We should not force feed children, but to satisfy an appetite. I've started from page two. <laughs> and the purpose of educators is to keep that appetite alive and not to find new and creative ways to force feed children like geese in the hope of producing intellectual pate. So the beginning is. <laughs> Why in a world where medicine is designed around individual genomes do we offer an 18th century education designed to turn pressure into a superpower? Why do we use assessments which force schools to teach to the test when we all know it's a poor fit for the coming century? Education must be holistic and designed to meet individual needs of each student and be a good fit for the context of their 21st century lives rather than being based upon a hypothetical notion of a non-existent average child, while legally schools must provide a broad and balanced education where children may encounter something appropriate to themselves as individuals, home educators must provide an education suitable to those particular individual needs. State education has become lazy, showering children with subjects in the hope that each child learns something suitable. It wastes billions teaching kids things that they can't remember and never needed anyway. The answer to children forgetting June's lessons by September is not to keep them in the classroom all summer, which has been suggested. It's to, keep, it's to, it's to teach them things or to cover subjects which are interesting to them and hold their minds, that they'll hold in their minds for more than just a few weeks. School culture is fundamentally judgmental a place where too many children learn to fail, damaging their self-esteem. If they're brave enough or desperate enough to refuse to participate, we criminalize their parents. There's something radically wrong with the system that offers learning for free and yet must physically force so many children into school. There's a disconnect here. I work with uh, families who are home educating mostly, that's my core interest. I home educated my four children myself and my, uh, with my ex-wife. And I've been doing this and involved in this for over 25 years now. And the more I see of it, um, the less able schools appear me, to me to be, to be able to prepare children for life in the outside world. Schools are a particular, they're not just a microcosm of society, they're a particular form of society, they're a closed environment. Sociologists study closed environments. They, they've got a name for it, I can't remember what it is offhand, but they have a name for this. You know, prisons and schools and the army uh, are the three usual suspects when they're studying these things. They don't reflect society, they reflect a 19th century society at best. 
and it doesn't exist anymore. It's not about what they're teaching so much as the entire ethos of the way schools are structured. And that's where the problem lies. You, we need to disassemble the construct of school and start again. Thank you. I don't know where I am this week. Oh, here we are. Um, good. I should just say, actually, um, these days I'm mostly um, Professor of Learning Innovation in UCJC in Madrid, so when it's not just. Um, I thought that you'd, you'd welcome some pictures, uh, and I'm hoping my throat mic is on because I'm going to walk out here. Uh, thank you, Peter, for what you said. Thank you, Jenny Lee, for what you did. Um, <laughs> We know an awful lot now about how to make learning better. Uh, we know the cognitive science. For example, this room is too dark. 500 lux would be a minimum. You're struggling to stay focused. It's way too hot. 17, 18 to 21 degrees is your sweet spot. And the folk at the front are slowly being gassed by the CO2 of your emissions sweeping down <laughs> here. You know. um, but it's pretty hard. And if the, my favourite learning institution in the world has got its rooms wrong, think how hard it is for everybody else. Kids, of course, have reached the point where the gene is out of the bottle. And that's what makes this so interesting. I smiled when James said, uh, no phones, you know, because I was in a school 18 months ago where the kids said, we're not, I said, get your phones out, measure the light levels. They said, we're not allowed phones. I said, yeah, well, you've got them, haven't you? That's sort of weird. We can <laughs> <laughs> whipped them out of their knickers, you know. And I said, "What happens when you get caught?" They said, "We carry a sacrificial phone, you know." <laughs> <laughs> so good luck, mate. You know. Um, <laughs> what they're doing with them, of course, is they're measuring, they're metering their learning environments. They're saying, "How oh, bells are CO two." It's high in Dubai. We found CO2 levels over 7,000, and of course, the kids in those classrooms were diagnosed as having ADHD. It was not the kids. It's the kids they had been on Ritalin for three or four years. Nothing wrong with the children. What the children do is BYOP. Here's from my Twitter feed. Um, kids bring their own plants in. 30 kids, 30 plants. Photosynthesis, Bosch, you know, CO2 in, oxygen out, everybody's happy. It makes a huge difference. And the husbandry and the science and the stem of building little self-watering pits sets all this alight. And we know that when we look at all the details, cognitive load is a tiny part of that. You know, 500 variables that make good learning. I do learning for the British Olympic team, the England rugby squad, some other places. And one of the things we learn is that aggregation of marginal gains. Everything, everything matters. Here are the girls' um, hockey team, this Team GB hockey team. We remodeled their learning space with um, um, James Clark, a space oasis, good friend. And you'll see the details here. Blow me down, it looks like a front-running primary classroom. I can write on every surface because we know the cognitive impact of social writing. I've got a physical floor where I can pick things up and put them down because cognitive load theory is magnified and accelerated by the physicality of movement. I've got a taught pedagogy from the teacher here who, having introduced the task, puts his hands in his pocket because he's a bloke and if he doesn't, he's going to interfere and he stands back and lets the girls get on with the problem solving using the knowledge they have. And if you follow hockey, you'll know that this team won gold and got there on set pieces and won it on heroism on the unexpected penalty shootout in the finals. And they have a thinking Thursday where they turn up on a Thursday and, blimey, this isn't what we were expecting, which is what schools need. So you've got to get your thinking Thursdays in there, James, as well as your regular timetable. And we know that 
when we take those kids and ask them to design our spaces, this is um, UCJC in Madrid. These little poppets here have redesigned the university for us. Five years down the track of redesigning their own schools. Not from their own opinions, which would be catastrophic. <laughs> you know, well, I want it black and a bar, you know. <laughs> but from their research of talking to other schools about what works. It was so effective, we brought them in to redesign the university. And this is CPD. Here are the university lecturers being led in how this space will work by these little poppets here. And they're full of ideas, like, for example, when you book a room, you get an envelope full of 3D models of the furniture that's going to be in the room you're going to use. So you can play with the layout of your room over breakfast before you turn up to teach a lesson. You know. See, kids' ideas. These are kids' ideas. You can just about read this. When you give them a tablet, you're going to have to give them phones because how else are they going to measure the sound levels and the light levels? And when they do, they say, you know what, we can fix the sound levels in the dining room. And look at what they did. If the sound levels go over 70 decibels, the price of custard doubles. It's really, <laughs> really simple. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know what? This is a Bondi Beach Primary School in Australia. I work in some lovely places. But you know what? They've never had to do it because the kids are all there making a din. The minute the, 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 the are all ages, as it happens behind the hatch, reach out to turn the prices around, the whole place goes quiet. You know, kids have control of themselves. Kids set their own protocols. But you know what? Is this just putting lipstick on the chicken? You know, is it, is it so hard? Is it so hard to improve schools that maybe we should do the best we can? Uh, you mentioned exams. I've been into over 80 exam rooms in the last two years. I haven't found one examination room that wasn't damaging the prospects of the children. And by the way, the kids sitting on the light side are going to be doing a lot better than the kids on the dark side. And what are you going to tell the parents when they find out? Maybe if we want to make learning better, maybe we do the best we can with the schools we've got. We haven't done that yet, have we? 900 million kids a year do exams. They don't even know what to eat for breakfast because nobody's done the research. Every single athlete in the world knows what to have for breakfast the morning of their big day. You wouldn't even know whether to stick a banana in every orifice you've got in the hope that it's going to kind of boost your potassium or maybe you should have something else. You know. So we could do a million times better, but... If we're going to do what Peter said bravely at the end of his talk, we're really going to do this. Let's start with the kids that it definitely isn't working for. Let's make it good for the kids who are turning up, lucky enough to have a school. But, you know, these kids in Pakistan that I've just started working with, 25 million children, not in education, and I've committed to get them into learning by 2025. 25 by 25. We haven't got a million spare teachers. They won't have teachers. We haven't got half a million schools. We can't afford schools. What we've got are children who can help each other and support each other, who can learn in a grounded way about the context they live in, their environment, their science, their flora, their fauna, with their parents, with their community. The model for it my daughter runs a beach school, Juliet. Beachschool.org. Go there, really interesting stuff. Beachschool.org. And the kids, preschool kids, are down on the beach, you know, looking at crabs and jellyfish and sharing with the community everything. Like this weekend, I was walking down the pontoon in the town, kids all crabbing. And what do I hear? I hear grandparents saying, Oh, how do you know it's a boy crab? And the children say, Well, if you turn it over, you can see there's a triangle on the bottom. This one's going to have eggs. The whole town is awash with knowledge about their environment. So I think absolutely what Peter said is right. You know, we can mend the world with learning. And we can do it for the kids who are sitting waiting for somebody to do something for them. It ain't ever going to happen. So let's arm them to help themselves. And I think we probably are looking today, this year, this decade, at the death of education. But rather excitingly, we're facing the dawn of learning. And I can't wait 
to see how good that's going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's some um, really fascinating and provocative ideas there. I'd just like to say to Mike that I can recognise an Oxbow Lake when I see one. <laughs> So yeah, but you never recognise a terminal moraine because <laughs> they taught you about them, but they don't exist. <laughs> it's like one of those bits of knowledge that, oops, we shouldn't have learned it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it served, me in, good, it served yeah. me in good stead. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, I want to open up um, to our audience now for questions and comments. Um, so um, please could you say um, who you are and where you're from? and try to keep it short so that we can get as many questions in as possible. We've got, I think we've been quite busy online. Yeah. So do we want to start with some questions there? Um, and then we'll move into the audience in the room. Hi, this is a question that's come in on live stream. Uh, it's from Polly Cheer from Blackburn. My question to the pan panel is this. I'm hoping that we're reaching a tipping point and that our ideas about the mismatch between how children learn and how our education system teaches are beginning to move into mainstream thinking. Rather than open another democratic school, I would prefer all schools to move towards being democratic. I realize we have a long way to go in changing a culture of teaching and learning. What does the panel feel is the best way of bringing our ideas forward into the minds of policymakers and education providers? Okay, so I think that that's a real, yeah. How do we get the policymakers to take these ideas on board? So. Well, look, policy, policymakers, you've got no chance. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> when I talk to head teachers, I often open with a slide of all past education ministers and say, who can name them? And nobody ever can, you know. The, is Gillian Shepherd, is that Mark Carlyle, was that, you know, nobody knows them. They kind of don't matter. They pass through, they say a few things and then they go, what really matters here is the community of learning professionals. Stand on the roof of a school and you will not see anywhere else between you and the horizon where you've got, you know, how many staff are you going to have, James, when you're full? 100 staff, postgraduate qualified, reflecting daily on something as complex as learning. That's a hell of a community, but you've also got the kids. You're going to have a 1,000 kids also doing the same thing. And that community of reflective practice is what makes change happen. Absolutely is. Don't if you wait for a politician you like. You'll be there a long time, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would concur with that. I think, you know, uh, secretaries of state come and go every five years, possibly. Um, they all, lucky every yeah, five years. Yeah, well, <laughs> it depends at the moment, doesn't it? But um, it... They all want to leave their mark, they want to leave their stamp, they want to you know, leave their legacy, as it were. Um, but actually, the, my experience is the process of change in education is much slower than that. And we don't give it enough time to actually bring things about and really embed them within schools. Um, and I think there's a really, as I said at the start of my, my, my talk, I think that um, there's a really good dialogue at the moment about education in all its different facets. But it takes time, and it's not, it's not going to be an overnight Success, yeah, isn't it? Movements are very simple thing. I'm sorry. Movements are a simple thing. You know, um, we know that you need to move for your brain to work. You've got the one heart, the blood goes to your legs, and then your brain. So if you're sat upright with your back like that and your legs horizontal, <coughs> the flow of oxygen to your brain is diminished. And if you stay like that for more than about 20 minutes, your attention, we can measure attention very accurately, will decline. If you get up during the lesson and move around, fine, your, your body gets brain, your, your, your brain gets oxygen, but it feels a bit like anarchy. So, you know, you've got to start thinking about zoning the classes and having a carousel of activities to get people moving around. None of this is hard, but it is really complicated. That's the key thing to get hold of. The challenge, if you don't get the policy makers to change, is that you're tinkering with the Titanic. You know, you're moving those deck chairs. And you may be enhancing their ability to do well in the exams, but actually, who cares? No, if the exams aren't measuring the things that we think are really important, that's really problematic. Which is why I think the model in Australia is really interesting. And I, I actually met someone who said they're doing the same stuff in the States. Of actually you know, trying out models in the way that Stephen actually did with Not School yeah. years ago, 
with the people who the system currently isn't catering for very well. And that allows you to build up the evidence base that actually this works. And the challenge then is about how do you persuade the next stage up the ladder to recognise the learning that has happened. So how do you persuade in the context of universities in Australia them to accept the kids who are coming out of big church schools with no qualifications but the most amazing portfolios? And that's the big challenge because that's hard. It's really easy to say, oh, look, three A's or three nines or whatever it is these days. Okay? But it's really hard if you're flicking through someone who's got this you know, amazing set of stuff, but it's time consuming to look through. And that's the challenge is how do we get to a stage where, and actually people like Google, they don't care about your grades. Now, if you're a computer programmer, they're going to go out on the web and see what your reputation is on the computer programming websites. So it's how do we change those metrics? That's the killer. And it's about parental pressure. It's about you voters saying, hey, this actually isn't okay. Right. Polly, did, uh, did you want to come? Poppy, sorry, did you want to come in on that? No? Uh, I don't think that's kind of my sort of area. Oh, okay. I'll leave it to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that, you know, about what Stephen said and the fact that wearing earrings obviously makes it even worse. That you can't learn if you're wearing earrings. Yeah, or there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got any questions in the room? Just... Um, we've got one here and one over there. Thank you. Peter Leeson from Milton Keynes, um, frequent public speaker and um, opinionated old man. <laughs> um, first of all, Peter, I've, I have spent 43 years working in IT and automation, and I don't agree with the focus on IT and automation that is currently happening in the education system and that you seem to be talking about, because it is largely, the majority of IT and automation is teaching people to do strictly what they've been told to say, follow the rules, obey the standards, and don't do anything else. I believe one of the things that is missing in the education system today, or the training system today, Kent's uh, Hill excluded, but largely we've given up on education, we're training. I'd like to see a lot more focus on creativity, on getting people to think. I believe that if you study foreign languages, if you study uh, Moliere, Mussorgsky, and Mondrian, you will learn a lot more on creativity, on challenging things, and on making things happen. Um, which doesn't bring me to my question. <laughs> Regarding challenging the policy makers and the authorities and the powers that be, what is your opinion of education systems like Montessori, which have been deployed over 100 years ago and still have not been adopted by any policy maker in the world? Thank you. I, I, I'll click in. Um, there are lots of models like Montessori like Steiner, like the big picture schools that you know, are very effective. And uh, for me, there, there isn't a right answer. Okay? There isn't one model that is the right model for everybody in every context. But they remain but local. After 100 years, we still cannot persuade a bloody politician to listen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the challenge is how do we do that? And it is about, you know, I've been working with the Labour Party, bless them, on their new education service. And, you know, they have some great ideas, but at the end of the day, they don't dare. Um, because I, don't they I don't want to damn all politicians. I mean, we, we're building a school, um, Limfield School of the Future, in New South Wales, which is fabulous. And Adrian Pickley, who is the inspirational minister, who when we said, yeah, it's going to be all through, stage on age. Stage on age, which is like the rest of the world, but not schools, you know, um, and a whole host of other things. He said, yeah, this is the way to go forward. And then, you know, three further ministers beyond that, they were all supporting the thing. And it opened last January, and it is an absolutely stunning vision of what it might look like. But you can't, really, you can't wait for all of them. And, you know, there are bits of Montessori that are fabulous, bits that are a bit odd. You know, the, the, the maths teaching, I think, is terrific. And you can, it, the, the VS um, furniture people in Hamburg have a museum of educational artifacts and uh, you know the Montessori math stuff is the strongest suit in there but on the other but Steiner has lots of good things but Steiner has the problem of if, 
if it ain't real, you can't talk about it. So if a submarine comes up in the village pond, you know, you can't, you can't study submarines and so on. So they've all got good and bad things. The point here is to take all the good bits and put it, but where do you do that? To Peter's point to the mind, really, you know, maybe we just do the best we can with the schools we've got. I remember with the not school kids, if you don't know not school, this was a virtual school we built for children who were excluded from school. So we had a thousand kids a year expelled. You didn't get expelled other than for doing fairly heinous things. And uh, they got on famously as a, as a cohort. 10,000 kids went through. But they said things like, you know, when you're really crap at something in school, they give you more of it. You know, and it's like, how's that ever going to work? You know, so sometimes just the, you know, the wisdom of the reflective practice of the learner themselves is the thing we've, we've wasted. We've got this huge crisis of lack of teachers, but at the same time, we've got millions of children. We have to engage them in the process too. And that seems to me where Montessori and, and Summer Hill, for goodness sake, as Neil saw it from day one, you know, involve the children and you'll get there quicker. And that seems to me to be the key thing. I mean, why the hell you haven't got the vote at 12? I don't know. You know it seems that would help. And, and, and it's interesting because England is one of the most locked down education systems and most difficult to challenge. Um, and so, you know, places like Australia and, and others, there's much more scope. But you should you, see Liberia. You right? should, <laughs> we've got to keep hitting our heads on the brick wall or emigrate. We've got another question um, over here. Um, can you pass the microphone down to the middle of that row? Thank you. Yeah, Next, Steve. Thank Couple you. of hands oh, on yeah. the back as well. Right? Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'll get, come to you in a minute. I'll take you first because you had the microphone already. Hello. And yeah, then I'm ready I'll to take go. The okay. lady right at the back. At, so you in the white shirt, gentleman in the green jacket, and then the lady right at the back, and then I'll see where we're going after that. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jason West. Um, I'm I live and work in this city, and I'm an OU graduate as well. Um, I'm also forming uh, a new charity, an educational wealth fund that's building a national endowment fund to help our schools become the most wondrous and inspiring places that humanity can provide. Why would our schools be any different? Um, our kids today are going through a mental health crisis by whatever metric you care to measure, um, whether you talk to doctors um, or, um, or you know, the, the people that are helping children within schools. Um, our children can recognise over 100 corporate logos, but they can't recognise their natural British wildlife. Um, we are seeing the extinction of music just yesterday. Um, the city orchestra here closed its doors because of the lack of interest. And um, I just wondered, um, how do we create the political will in a system where our political leaders are so feckless? Is it not time now that the solution is to decouple <coughs> education from government? <laughs> and, and that Thank question you. goes to number one, please. Well, well, I mean, you know, th clearly, if politicians would just mind their own business, I mean, that's why the <laughs> Labour Party want a national education service because the government doesn't dare tinker too much with the national health service because it would cause an outcry. And if we could decouple them from making decisions about education, the problem is we've all, you know, we saw we spent years in formal education. We all think we know how school works, yeah. and you know, and politicians will come in and they'll decide to do things, and bless Gove, but. Jesus. <laughs> uh, I, I, so I absolutely agree with you. We should be able to get them to do that, but I don't have an answer of how. But it is complicated. I mean, I'm curious. I'm doing work in the health service too, and you won't surprised, be surprised to hear that you know, one of the issues, say, in pharmacies is the very high level of error. Um, you know, they just keep giving you the wrong stuff. Next time you're in Boots or you know, other pharmacies are available, <laughs> You just have a look at how dark the rooms are they're in and how gloomy they're. Of course, they're making blinky mistakes. They're, you know, they're being sort of um, put in a, a, an artificial coma, really, by the, <laughs> by the, by the building they're in. And, and the hospital wards are not places where you would be bright and alert. They're places where you just walk around like a zombie and fall over and yeah. they end up back in the ward. So th what's interesting here is where do you get the change from? Wind back in time to medicine where people, you know, the barber's pole in every haircut shop in the country is a, a bloody rag around, around the pole. And for a long time, 
people bled you, you know, if you weren't very well. I had a whole chart of places where I could bleed you, and where you got bled for your living, you don't want to know, you know. And, and, and they were judged on, not whether the patient survived, but how many times they were bled. And I think we're a bit like that in education at the moment. Never mind what happens to the kids when they're 30, and we've been driven crazy by all this. How many tests did we give them, you know? Well, the change didn't come from a minister saying, I'll tell you what, hygiene is the way forward. The change came from people saying, you know what? His patients aren't dying, his are, I'm going here. You know, and in the end, people see and people understand, and kids in particular. And for me, the genie is out of the bottle with kids because they're all over Pinterest, they're all over the social media that's part of their life, swapping ideas about what's effective and what isn't. We won't put the, that genie back in the bottle. And there's change right there, no matter who the minister is. OK, I'm going to take... I'm going to take two questions at once. So I'm going to take yours and then the lady right at the back, on the very back row. Okay. Peter, in your presentation, there was one slide, and I don't know whether it's been responded to by anybody really, and it suggested that um, the function of schooling, and particularly assessment in schooling, was to produce at least 30% failures. Okay, that, that slide was in there. I hope I read it right. I spent most of my professional career outside of this institution working with some of those 30% failures. And try as they might, I was one of them at that point when the things turned around. I just wonder how we are going to address the question of the reproduction of inequality that schools and all formal education systems are engaged in, including, I'm afraid, this austere egalitarian institution. It is in the business of producing successes and failures. All formal education institutions are involved in that business. What do we do? I, I love that question. As BBC students are responsible for student success in the university, I think that's a very well-made point. I'll come to you in a moment, Peter, to respond. But I just want to take that other question right at the back. Um, hello. I'm, I'm just somebody who's wandered into the lecture. So um, <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. I don't have an education background. But you'll understand why. I've tried to um, summarise my thoughts. Um, as someone who studied in Nigeria, both in private and um, state public education or state school, and um, also in the UK, both in private and state school, um, I'm a bit conflicted when people talk about how education is terrible in this country and the problems that you're having. It's a real privilege to be able to be in a room where people are actually criticising the education, education system and expecting some real change. Um, um, so... Two thoughts, the first one being that um, the traditional model enables um, children, students, to understand social codes and norms, to develop a level of grit, to work in a structured environment, which I think is important for children, in the alternative um, sort of system. There is the focus or preference for experimentation, diversity and self-development. So I understand the benefits that both provide. And actually what this brings to mind is the actual divide between private and state school education. So like, I be, I've forgotten your name, but the, uh, the lady who went to Summerhill? Poppy, I beg your pardon. Um, private education allows exactly the model that you're talking about, where there is a classroom environment, but there is a lot of focus on experimentation and learning outside of the classroom. Um, I just don't know that we should be doing away completely with or talking about this, the traditional version as a completely broken system and we should perhaps focus more on improving the, the traditional system rather than do, doing away with it completely. Okay, I think those, those two questions can be linked quite nicely because, uh, because they both really relate to the kind of reproductive nature of our educational system. So I, uh, can I start at this end with, with James? Do you want to respond to either of those? Yeah, or I can try and respond or to both at the, the both, same time, yeah. maybe. Thank you. Um, you know, I, th I think you make valid points. I think there are lots of fantastic things about our state school system. Um, and uh, in my previous job, I was, I was director of a boarding house um, uh, in Burford, in West Oxfordshire. And we used to have hundreds of children come across to us, international students, because they valued British education. Um, and because they compared it to the education systems that they, they had experienced as they were growing up. And they saw how, how valuable ours was um, and therefore wanted to pay for that um, kind of privilege, I guess is, is the word 
um, that you would use. Um, and that balance, we were a state boarding school, so that balance between uh, you know, boarding and, and, and day school children, you could see the benefits that they were getting by the, by the additionality of being part of the British uh, educational system, but also what boarding life brought to them and the opportunities for the extracurricular and learning outside of the classroom and really engaging with different communities and cultures in all sorts of different ways that you don't get a, from half past eight to half past three. Um, and that, I think that's really valuable and um, I think makes a massive difference. Um, and just coming back to the, the point that was made earlier about political interference, I think you know, you've got the assessment systems there is, is based on political interference and, and the measuring of children as they come out the other end, they have to prove that they've got value for money. Um, and um, I think you would see a massive cultural change in schooling and education and what is measured if there was less political interference in it. I think people would be a whole lot braver to make those decisions about what is right for the children in front of them rather than am I going to get hammered by Ofsted if my Progress 8 figure is not good enough? Or am I going to get hammered by Ofsted if I've taught subjects that I think are really valuable but don't count in those progress measures? And that's the reality of what we, we face day in, day out. We make curriculum decisions based on the accountability measures. And within that, the 9 to 1 grading of GCSEs, the SATs results, all those kind of things, the, 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 the bell curve of, of those that succeed and those that fail is really, in my view, a bit of an arbitrary measure imposed by government as to whether a four is a pass or a five is a pass and all the kind of fallibility that sits around that. So I don't know whether I've answered any of those questions or all of those questions, but I but suppose that's, that's the reality yeah. for me on a day-to-day -day basis. Could, could I ask both Poppy and Mike to say a little bit about this success and failure and how it's defined, and, and particularly, Poppy, your experience at Summerhill. Did that get you to think differently about what success was? So which one am I answering? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever um, one you like. Uh, so yeah, I mean, even now, what is success? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm 18 now, actually. <laughs> so I'm 18. Wait, can you guys hear me? I can't hear myself. OK, cool. Um, I'm 18. I got two GCSEs and a vocational course at like a merit. I ha I ha I'm working full time with three different jobs, plus doing things on the side. I mean, what is success? Is, it, is success? getting all your GCSEs, 11 GCSEs, getting very, well, not everybody, getting maybe <coughs> depressed, anxious, you know, uh, harming yourself, as I've heard a lot of people do, going through that stress to get 11 GCSEs and end up where? Where do people go? All my friends that have stayed in the state school system, they're doing nothing. They're working in cafes. They're, you know, serving tea and, you know, letter dropping. I mean... You need to look at that, you know, the 11 GCSEs or the girl who had the freedom from a young age got hardly any GCSEs and I'm not an, in, not, sorry, not intelligent, I mean not, um, what's the word, academic, I'm not an academic person but, you know, look at the balance. So success, I mean, I, I can't really define what that is. But did what you did you say um, earlier, there was a question you asked um, about... The point I was trying to make was that um, I don't think dismant dismantling the existing school structure is the answer. My daughter, to, so to make this point properly, my daughter, who's five, goes to a school now where she's the only black person, not child, person in the entire school. So it's not representative of the society that she lives in. We recognise that that's a problem that the school has to fix or find a way of managing and coming up with them. Um, proactive systems to manage that. Um, but I would not then say we throw away, you know, the baby with the bathwater, essentially, because the school is a good school, you know, on it. Um, so if we, if we do away with things like sh um, structure, if we do away with learning r nonsense, so the things that you are not, you don't think are useful, but later in life actually become quite useful. I did medieval history which I don't use now. Um, but when I watch the news, it comes back to me. So no knowledge is lost. And I think this conversation about the things we learn in school, 
being unuseful or irrelevant is, or is, is paradoxical because at the same time we're saying all knowledge is useful. that we do away with all structure. We're just saying we need different structures and we need more flexible structures. No one is saying we do away with any curriculum. We're saying we need different curriculum. You know, part of the problem that Steve's talking about is everyone has to do the same thing. And that is something that someone out there has decided is, is valued. And they are from a particular context. And the system serves some people really well, right? And they, you know, part of the, the reason it's difficult to change He's actually, most of those politicians are quite happy with the system. They've done okay in it, thank you very much. You know, and you know, why would they change it? Because that might disadvantage their kids, right? And we need a system that, that has different metrics for different people. That say, we're all good at something, right? But not if you go to school, right? Because at school, only the things that have been predefined by somebody else as being important are the things that matter. But everybody is good at something, even if it's just been a pain in the ass when they're little. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I had you know, all sorts of creative ways of being a pain in the ass when I was little too, which actually you know, end up being put in books about law and stuff. You know, um, because they, they, everything has got some value. You've just got to recognise it and recognise we're not all the same. And God help us, if we all were the same, we'd be in deep trouble. And I do think also, um, yeah, I'm def I agree there. And I don't think that I want to take away the whole system because I do ag agree with what you said. It is a good system. <laughs> I, I think that the education system in the UK is, it's, um, I've got two opinions. I'm kind of, I'm happy with it in a sense. But I then go to loads of different other countries and I go and visit schools and they're so free and they're running about and they're climbing trees and it's just like Summerhill, it's like my home, but in other countries. So I kind of have this mixed feeling between not being happy and, you know, the, the success rates are good, you know, A's, 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 but then you need to look deeper into that and you need to think, is that person self-harming? Is that person wanting to jump off of that mountain? Is that person hating their life? Is that person getting on with their parents? And I think, you know, when, before Summerhill, I was the most dreadful child you could ever imagine. And me and my mum even speak about it. I was so bad. Me and my mum had a bad relationship. Now we're best friends. We're, we get on so, so well. And I get on with everybody. And I'm 18. People look at me, they're like, wow, you're 18? I thought you were like 25. I don't know why that is. But I think that's because I had the freedom from a young age to then learn what I want and what I actually want and the decisions I make and just speaking openly and not caring what other people have to say. Wouldn't I'm going to, to, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to close it there because we are right out of time, but I think it's quite right that Poppy, Poppy has demonstrated that she's really happy, so for me that's a great success. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so um, we can continue the debate over refreshments, um, which are available downstairs. Um, I just want to say thank you to um, Peter and to all our panellists for a really interesting discussion.